27 year headache. Chapter 5 of the life of God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53. The same year I graduated from law school, 1982, my son Justin was born in 1985, my daughter Brooke was born. In 1988, my youngest child and daughter, Laura, was born. I was making good money, though I expected a lot more, in my first job with a law firm that specialized in collections. I also tried my first civil case, which while while working there, which was a, a nerve-wracking event, first trial. The first day I entered the courtroom, the judge asked me if I was a law clerk. I had a very youthful appearance, though I was 28 years old, not 20, common age for a law clerk. My youthful appearance in junior high school and high school with my long waity blonde hair, I usually kept in a ponytail, had way too many people tell me I look like a girl. It is interesting though, at least to me, not one person in my entire life has ever said anything about my disfigured none. I must have looked like a girl who would beat on you if you did it. When I got mad there was no hiding it. You could see it in my face and hear it in my words. When I was 28, Brooke was born, I tried my first civil case, and the bane of my existence on earth began. A never-ending headache that I generally thought to be associated with post-traumatic stress disorder. I had terrible nightmares from my youth, but now I seem to have begun grinding my teeth, causing the temporal mandibular joint, TMJ, uh, to ache terribly during the day, and the whole side of my head, the muscular, I don't know what you call it, but under, underneath the skin of the skull uh, was always real tight. A tightening of the muscles. Uh, it was difficult to even talk to people at some points. For 27 years I had that headache. I tried every time. Even surgery on the TNJ. And another surgery where the doctor severed my upper jaw and then trisected it from my skull and spaced it to fit my lower jaw. All to no avail. I could not stop the nightmares and the grinding of my teeth. Mouth guards helped my teeth, but the pressure was still there. I literally feared going to sleep. I didn't, I didn't want to wake up the next day sometimes because I knew how bad I, the pain would be there again. Uh, it completely ended my dream of being a trial lawyer. So I got an associate position in an oil and gas firm and began learning how to prepare title opinions for oil and gas companies on tracts of land they plan to drill on. Basically a title opinion is you start from sovereignty, which is when the state granted the land to someone, usually great large tracts of land, and um, from there, you get parceled out and cut up, and uh, I'd be chasing one small track within a, a very large one almost 200 years ago in the early 1800s. And uh, I would have to create genealogical charts of airship, you know, for people who died without a will. And they had to know who the family members were, and I got very good at it, and I really enjoyed it. I'd go to small uh, towns throughout Texas, and uh, into their uh, courthouses where they would keep all the records of every transaction, of every piece of land in the county. Uh, but anyway, there's, there's an awful lot to it. I do go into it in some detail in the book, but I'm not going to for this video. Eventually, I had my own firm. It's just me in my own office, and I was doing very well, though billing hours for title work is generally uh, lower than other areas of the law, you know, by the hour. Uh, but I had also been involved in multi-million dollar sales of production between oil and gas companies, probated wills, prepared affidavits of airship, 
works with landmen to fix title defects, appellate work, including arguments before justices, plea bargaining criminal cases for defendants, and uh, anything else that came my way. Then it all stopped, and once again, I was fighting for my life in 2001. This is chapter six, skin, colon, and lung cancer. Oh, just, uh, God would have me tell you, he, uh, he gave me those headaches. When he came to me, I stopped having nightmares. He provides my dreams for me now. And uh, often as a learning experience. But the grinding of the teeth, everything stopped. And, and I, I thought it was just because I wasn't having nightmares. Uh, and took away any symptoms of PTSD. Uh, for which I was uh, receiving money from an insurance company. For disability, partial disability. And uh, that went on for about seven years. Then one day we're out walking year seven of 13. And... I had that headache. It just, he just, it just came, and I just stopped. And I said, "You got to be kidding! You did not give me those headaches." He said, "Yes, I did. It's necessary. You, you, you are considered the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. You had to suffer your entire life until until you're suitable for my purpose, and that includes sitting every verse." Of Isaiah 53. At that time, I had I finally read it. Seven years into all this, it was about year two, I think. But yeah, he did. And you know, I ended up taking painkillers left and right, and drinking with it, as so many people do. Uh, I was able to maintain, you know, my life, my work, and everything. But uh, it was enough to put the strain on my marriage that I pretty much blame myself for it. And I told him I did. This is the only time I got hot. Disfigure me, um, gut shot, those things, they didn't bother me. But I said, you know, you hurt my children terribly with that. Because I became a bad father. I mean, I wasn't the father I could be. I mean, they love me and I love them. We don't have any serious risks. They, they're off living their lives and they're all doing great. Um, But they, if they consider themselves anything, they're Christians. And uh, although I don't think any of them are overtly uh, religious, uh, or that they, they're, in Sunday, they're in church every Sunday or anything like that, but, you know, when I started going to uh, Beth, uh, the conservative synagogue here in town, and I told them I was converting to be Jewish, they, they're pretty much just that. Just saying I would be a Jew, I guess. I, I'm not sure or that I didn't believe in Jesus was probably more of it, God says. But uh, really haven't talked to them much at all in seven or eight years. So, but anyway, so God gave me the headache just to make sure. Um, Anyway, I was married to Denise for 18 years, and we divorced in 1997 for irreconcilable differences. We agreed that she maintained custody of the children. The first to leave was Justin, and he came and lived with me. Then Brooke started getting in trouble, who is as tough as she is beautiful. Her, her mom's very difficult to get along with. Justin was a lot like me at his age, and trouble followed him everywhere he went. Like me, he was hard to talk to, and like me, his getting out of high school was a coin flip. He's doing great. He learned the oil and gas landman business, and I helped him out as much as I could, and, and friends of mine helped him out even a lot more. And he's very successful now. Um, married, uh, no children. Laura's married, no children. She's got a great job. And um, uh, Brooke is married with two children. Two, I have two grandchildren. Long life, see his children. You, you'll see what I'm talking about, long life, when I get to the lung cancer. That God chose to crush me with. Something had to be done, and to make matters worse, Denise had met a man, and they were going to get married. But he didn't want Brooke. 
to be part of their new family, uh, or Justin for that matter. He, he wasn't going to go stay with them anyway. Now, I had two of the children, and she had one, but all still in her custody according to the divorce decree. So anyway, I stopped paying child support on those two, but had not gotten around to the proper revision of the divorce decree when I took Justin and Brooke with me to live on the big island, Hawaii. Laura came with us to visit for a month. This oversight on my part resulted in Denise and now her third husband filing papers in divorce court for past child support for all three children. For the time I had begun paying her one third of the original amount. I represented myself. I had one contempt of court and was locked up for a day. But I never had to pay that money. By verbal agreement, I sent Laura back exactly one month later. I could not leave her out and I wanted her to see where her brother and sister would be living. They were all so close and protective of each other and still are to this day. And uh, she was so sad. One of the hardest and emotionally painful things I have ever done was put her on the plane back to Houston. I, I can't think of anything else. The backdrop to moving to Hawaii was my firm was in dire need of new work. Uh, but the oil and gas industry was down. It's always up and down. And my clients were not drilling. A landman I knew called and said his sister in Hawaii, a brilliant eye doctor, but not a good businesswoman, needed help resolving creditor issues stemming from her new offices and equipment purchases. I told him it was a good time for me as things were slow and uh, who's going to turn down free expense trip to, to uh, the Big Island Hawaii. So I went and took care of everything without charge, but of course everything was paid for. When I came back to live in Hawaii at the urging of the doctor that I had helped, who did not like the look of an abrasion on my chest, and it had been there for years, I was examined by a friend of hers and it was cancer. I don't remember what the doctor called it. He removed it in surgery with a six inch diameter circular cut and it was not malignant. I could practice in just about any area of the law. And all I had to do was pass the Hawaii bar exam, one of the toughest in the nation. While studying for the bar, my body all at once in a moment told me something bad was wrong with me. I had been running, swimming, riding my bike everywhere I went, letting Justin have the car, and had been feeling good and strong. In a moment's time, I was weak and sick while grocery shopping, and it was a pain in my belly and my abdomen. I did not know it, but a large tumor in my colon had burst through my colon, and I was bleeding internally. I did not go to a doctor, uh, which I guess is my nature, that and I did not have medical insurance. Anyone asking for help, asking anyone for help in the same way the critical stage, such as a bullet wound, uh, was something I just I couldn't do. I mean, just all kinds of personality <laughs> disorders. <coughs> uh, I thought surely it would pass and decide to just give it time and bear up to the abdominal and belly pain. I continued studying and took the Hawaii bar on Oahu and Honolulu in the summer of 2001. I had lived in pain for so many years from my headache and passing the bar was so important, I just kept going day by day. Pain was getting worse, and um, but I kept exercising. It was the only time I, I didn't focus on the pain. I had always been a fast healer, and I thought that any day it would just go away. I finally could no longer take it. Brooke, it turns out, was in Houston uh, visiting with her mom, and I left Justin at our little, we called it the Little Green Shack. There wasn't much to it. We weren't there very often, really, except to sleep, and went to Houston to find a doctor for diagnosis, staying at my parents' townhome. This is where I'm at now. 
I had allowed my major medical insurance to lapse using premiums for child support when things had gotten lame. I just needed someone to tell me what was wrong. I would find a way to take care of whatever the diagnosis was. Every September, I was close to dying, lying on the floor of a dingy apartment of a friend who traveled for work. I could no longer get up to even try and get medical help. And I had not told anyone how bad it had become. Then the planes hit New York. Seeing how grief-stricken so many relatives were on the news, I began to think for the first time how awful my children would feel when they found out how and where I died all alone. So I asked my father, again, it's hard for me to ask people for things, for the money to pay for a colon examination that had been suggested by a doctor at one of those clinics you find in a strip mall, the only places I could afford. The doctor who performed the colonoscopy finally found what was making me so ill and unable to eat. A malignant tumor, six to eight inches long, that had burst through my colon and I was bleeding internally. You know, I, I, I come out of anesthesia, partial anesthesia, and he's holding this picture, and there's this great big purple blob, and he says, I couldn't get the scope past this. <laughs> it's not a good way to wake up. <clears throat> to say it crushed me in my life is an understatement. The pain, the weight loss, inability to eat, all I could do was drink calorie drinks. Began about four months before the colon examination. That was four months of sheer pain. But as it turns out, I did pass the Hawaii bar exam. It was now early October 2001. The doctor told me, look, you don't have insurance. Go to Bentop Hospital. That's the hospital I went to when I got gut shot. Gunshot. I prefer gut shot. It sounds better. Yeah, man. And he gave me the pictures from the procedure showing what he could not get the scope past. He's shaking his head and saying, I, baby, you, know, you should have come in much earlier. So I went to Ben Tom thinking I was here in 75 on October 5, dying, but I did survive. And here I am again on the first week of October 2001. I showed the pictures to the admitting nurse. Instead of him sending me to the waiting room, she just looked at me and she said, My, this is a public hospital. I mean, you can wait all day long to have a cold check. She looked at me and said, why did you wait so long? And how are you still alive? And I told her, I have no idea. She did not send me to the waiting room. They had an orderly, orderly take me immediately to a room. There they hooked me up to a morphine machine where I could hit a button at a time interval I can no longer remember and receive a small dose. I do know I never missed one. I was very depressed and my parents who waited in that line for admittance with me looked so sad and depressed. It was not one of my better days, though I finally had some pain relief. Day after day, I lay there waiting for the next test they would run. Uh, it was during this time I received notification that Denise had filed uh, papers in the divorce court to recover monies for uh, the time I was taking care of two of the children. Uh, it's also when I received notification from Hawaii that I had passed the bar exam. So, you know, Bentall Hospital, what a lifesaver. I mean, uh, young surgeons in like Baylor University, uh, medical schools, you know, it's, it's a prime position to get your hands on uh, if you're going to be a surgeon because you, you, you're in surgery all day long and all night long. As long as you can stand up, they're bringing people in. It's just a real hot spot in Houston and a great hospital. But it's not a place you want to stay. You really don't. My doctor would come in and be out so fast, I never knew what was going on. He did tell you my previous surgery to my abdomen, where they opened me up from stem to stern, um, complicated removal of the tumor. On October 25, my son's birthday, he was now stuck in Hawaii, 
They cut me open again on the December. <clears throat> uh, it was about a week or so later, I was released with a schedule for chemotherapy. I returned to the dingy apartment all alone. I just stared at the television for weeks. I did, um, and chemo, so depressing for those who had to go into it. A small room with big chairs for about 20 people who all look like death, including me. And everyone with an assortment of bags of chemo dripping into our arms for hours. It took about eight hours before I really got sick from it. And I had to park a long way to avoid paying for parking and drive a long way to the apartment. It was a very gloomy fall and winter. When I completed my chemo of once a week for six or nine months, more tests were scheduled. I do not remember how many months the chemo lasted. I do remember I did not finish, missing the last three sessions. At the end, I could not get out of the door without bursting into tears and just not go. It just wore me down to nothing. On the right side, it was my goal. <laughs> I had my own apartment called The Loft. It was brand new and very nice on a bio close to downtown Houston with a running trail alongside it and lots of woods near Memorial Park where I had been running a three-mile circuit for since high school. I returned to being time for follow-up tests, including x-rays of my chest, and the colon cancer had not re returned then and to this day. The chest x-rays were another matter entirely. The doctor told me he had bad news and showed me the x-rays telling me the white spots I was seeing was cancer. They were everywhere. Lungs full of cancer, he said, at a stage I could not be treated with any success. My dad was with me and I asked the doctor, well, what does that mean? And when he said you need to prepare for death, the look on my father's face was so sad and hurt at the same time I'll never forget. And that, and we've been through some tough things in this house. Every house we've been in. It didn't affect me one bit. I did not feel anything. I was too beat down from the chemotherapy to care, I guess. God tells me I had a lot to do with that. And in fact I I just didn't I just no matter what they said, I didn't think I was gonna die. But I didn't know that. I just wasn't having that conscious thought. And God says he had a lot to do with that. <clears throat> of course, he hadn't spoken to me yet. I had never seen a doctor for cancer or any other ailment since that day. I had to get Justin home was all I thought about. But I needed money. I found an old client that needed a title penny for a drill site well. I struggled through that and got my boy back to Houston. And it was tough. I was so weak. And it been so long since I really had done any title work. And just going to pick the work up and visiting with the client was a major to do for me. But, uh, but we got there and I got Justin home and he went to live with some childhood friends. This was now 2002 and going into 2003. I just walked all over the running trails in the three mile loop at Memorial Park and in the woods day after day. I didn't think about dying, but I did start, but I did not think about restarting my law practice either. I watched a lot of television and played video games. I watched the Tour de France for the first time and got inspiration from Lance Armstrong. I was still alive though, and the funny thing was my lungs never bothered me. I was never sick. It's because God had already removed it. After I got the news I was dying of lung cancer, he took them from me. That's what he tells me. And I've never, I don't have any symptoms. I, well, as you'll see right here, in 2005, I picked up some title work here and there and made an office out of my loft. I bought my first motorcycle, soft-tailed lowrider Harley Davidson. First time in many years I was happy. I love riding that bike. In 2006, I did some landman work for standard day wages and began dieting and running. Uh, once again, 
once again, my camera only uh, goes for 29, 59, 29 minutes and 59 seconds. And I gotta, I'm gonna back, back up just a little bit. In 2006, I did some land work for Sandra Day wages and began dieting and running. I had never been a swimmer in terms of training for it. I love the water and swimming, but I never trained with laps at different paces and various distances. Mostly because I was so slow, because of my right arm. I was reaching an age, though, where endurance in my running was more important than speed. And so endurance swimming was too. In Hawaii, I had seen the athletes come to Kailua Kona, where we live and where the Ironman Triathlon begins and ends. Matter of fact, my, my little green shack was just right on the route where they start. That was a fun week. And it was amazing watching the athletes train and prepare for the race. I would think to myself, a human being, the human body cannot do what they are doing. Yet they were and they did. It's just amazing. I decided to learn how to swim more efficiently and how to train for distance and endurance. Get a regular and triathlon bike and enter some tri uh, triathlons. I'm still alive and finding a direction and purpose in my life. Training every day for long periods of time. It really helped with my headache and I slept better. In 2007, I signed up for the March 30, 2008 Lone Star Half Iron Triathlon in Galveston, Texas, and the October 5, 2008 Longhorn Ironman 70.3 in Austin, Texas. You cover 70.3 miles, and you got to do it under eight hours. And uh, I, I was, <clears throat> I did real well in the first one. Uh, as far as my time, it's seven minutes, uh, I mean, seven hours and a little bit, but I barely, barely made it, made it without disqualification in the one in Austin. And it was primarily because of the hills. It's this very hilly area in West uh, Central Texas, I guess. But, uh, but I did make it and uh, swore I'd never do another one. <laughs> but I did that after the first one, too. It's tough. Um, my insurance is still paying for my inability to work, primarily based on the headache and a diagnosis of PTSD. So I was not working, and I got real serious in trained to swim the 1.2 miles in the ocean. And uh, that would be in Galveston and, and in a lake in Austin, 56 miles on the bike, and a half marathon, 13.1 mile run. That's what I was able to do with a diagnosis in 2001 of lung cancer that could not even be treated, stage four. And that's just about the impossible. It would take a miracle of God for that to happen because generally you're gonna die within one year. They say if you get lucky with good medical treatment, you might make five years. But one year is the standard if you can make it that long. That's my proof that I offered myself to guilt for God. Because you can't, it's not something provable. All you can do is show the results of that offer. And again, guilt's an emotion. I got way too many videos and everything to get too detailed on it. But that is the proof. You know, I got the, the colon cancer 20, you know, 20 years ago when the planes hit New York. And it was two that. Oh, that was 2001, right. Too many things go through my mind when I start thinking about those cancer years. But uh, God, uh, he removed it. He had something for me to do, but that, that's, that's verse 10. God chose to crush him with disease. And as I've mentioned, the reason he chose that is to show that I was blemished, defective, could not possibly be an offer for sacrifice because he knew what the Gentiles were going to do. They were going to put an unblemished lamb in there and call it their, and call the Jewish people's Bible their own and use the laws of Leviticus, not unlike Mr. Tobias Singer and his six million blemished ram sacrificed by Hitler, the righteous servant of God. <laughs> now that seems to be, he's welcome to uh, uh, 
uh, you know, respond any way he wants to do that, but it's on the video, it's in the book, uh, it's in quotes by him from his midrash, from his site, and he said, share this with everybody. Everybody can take it and just share how great my knowledge is. Well, it's lacking in some areas. There ain't any question he's an intelligent man, but his reasoning capabilities, in my opinion, at least as Isaiah 53, are severely wanting. I am that man. And um, God's going to give the Christians hell with it and with me. Just like he, you know, I just heard this for the first time on the video when all of a sudden he had me say that Jesus announced <laughs> he, he wasn't the man of Isaiah 53 on the cross when he said, Father, 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 why are you forsaking me? Because he was about to die. And Isaiah 53, who he thought he was, and he's not, uh, who he, he didn't fit the verses, but he thought he was, he's supposed to be exposed to the death. But give him on line. So boldly he goes into the Roman uh, uh, Jerusalem and gets himself taken up. He's not worried. You know, delusional, yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, but as far as I'm concerned, he's nothing but a story. He never existed. And the story starts with the Essenes of the Red Sea Scrolls and the teacher of righteousness. Real quick, real quick, I'll go over that. Here's the thing. Their founder is called the teacher of righteousness. Okay? They were great followers of Isaiah. They had the great scroll of Isaiah. The prolific writers and copyists. They had their own gate at Jerusalem. The Essenes gate. Now the New Testament never mentions them. You got Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes. But they never mention an Essene. And Jesus, quite frankly, would have been one of them. Because they embody who he is. They didn't like riches, hated sinning, they didn't like material things. They removed themselves from, from Jerusalem in the most part to those caves by the Dead Sea for that very reason. But they did have a gate. They still had people who would be there. And you know what they would do at the gates? Tell stories. That's what you do. You tell stories. And it is a great story. Here's this guy. He's connected with God. Back then they believed men were God. Caesar was a God. You know, over in Egypt, you had the same thing going on. It's common thought that men could be gods. And this story just springs up. And um, there isn't any question. They'd have gone and questioned it. I mean, they're, at the, they're, they're, they're sitting right front and center in Jerusalem. You, you think they didn't hear? <laughs> this man walking on water, raising the dead, feeding 5,000 with two fish and five loaves. Uh... You know, turning water to wine. That alone, Rome would have said, Caesar would have said, he does what? He turns water to wine. Huh, bring him to me. Don't touch a hair on his head. You don't kill the man who turns water to wine. You send him out with your armies. Make your men happy. It's all, you know, there's so many ridiculous aspects to it. Most particularly, God performed a human sacrifice for the sinning, for the sinning Gentiles. He, he's left the sinning Jews for the sinning Gentiles. But he gives them, he gives them an out, these Gentiles, not his children. He gives them an out. I, I know, uh, uh, I'm going to kill my son for you so, so that you'll be forgiven or violate my commandments and laws. If anybody knows God, and the Jews do, and I know him like nobody's business, that's not him. That's not him. I mean, he told the Jews, I'm never going to leave you, but I will punish you. Now, that's him. <laughs> that, that's him. And he'll put you to hell just to make you a better person, a better people. Uh, and he has no plans of changing that. He's not going to change the minds and the thinking of billions of people to make them, to make them love the Jew. He's just not going to do it. And, and the practicality is he didn't create man for him to even be able to do that. Now, he could have created his humanity where he could do that. He could change the mind of everybody at the same time. But I'll tell you on this, he's been working on my mind for 13 years. It is one brutal cop bump. It's, it's a very one-on-one -on -one affair. Now, he says, now, I could just kill everybody. I mean, that's easy enough. That's easy. I could just kill everyone, but... 
He said, that's not, you know, it, it's, it, it's all about this. you got to know how to read the Bible. It, you know, it's written for antiquity first and the Dark Ages and then the Age of Enlightenment. I mean, basically he's saying you've got to go back over it. You've got to check these guys. You've got to check Ram Bam and his speech. God's going to make the world speak Hebrew. Or, yeah, they will be in the pure speech. You've got to check some of this stuff. And I read Rashi's, you know, I, I, I went to his Isaiah 53 Madrash, and uh, all I can say is very unimpressed. I see what he has to say in Malachi. He didn't pick up on any of this. He didn't know what the angel of the Lord is, the angel of the covenant that you desire. He doesn't know how Moses goes by a burning bush that's not consumed. The angel of the Lord is in there, and God speaks. I do. To me, it's just like, well, you just get some basic concepts, and you know, all of a sudden, and, and quite frankly, it'll open up the scripture to the Jews. They can put the town of the side for a little while. But I will say this. God says, you know, if you can study it, study it. There's all kinds of great things in it. Just be real careful about what you teach from it. And it's useful for heaven. If you like, if you like to talk about talent as a scholar with other Jews who may very well be in a scroll of remembrance with you, you can meet up with them. You'll see them in the meeting places, have them over to your room. Y'all can watch the new earth being created and the new peoples of God chosen and watch the evolution of the chosen people. And humanity, the same as this one, God says, why would I change it? Why would I change it? When I did it, it was perfect. And you can tell Mr. Singer that the evolution that he's talking about where all of a sudden the world's going to love the Jews been going on for over 3,000 years and, it hadn't even, and, and today anti-Semitism is up and David is here. It's not going to happen. Thank you very much. I will be doing... Um, oh, that, was that 5 and 6? Yeah, that was 5 and 6. Now the book picks up at chapter 7. It's on a video when God first speaks to me. And it's, it's very interesting. And um, we'll still be putting some videos out. But I've pretty much covered all the major material. Everything from Isaiah 53 and the Day of the Word, Lord. There, there's, there's a few more things. And it's a better read than it is a video watch. But, uh, you know, for those who like to read. But it's, it's covered very well in these videos. And uh, uh, now that I've put in the personal part in, which is to show how I fit Isaiah 53, and you see the difference in my life. Now, that's the life of suffering. That's a life of pain. That's a life of familiar with disease. You know, they say, gee, well, he died on the cross. He, he, was, he was scourged. He was scourged and this and that. Do you know how much he suffered in his life? I mean, he's not even in the conversation as a man of suffering. He's not in the conversation. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people died horrific deaths back then and, and, and by crucifixion. It's not the only one. This is descriptive of a man in his life. So you can find him identify him and what did he do he never suffered he's never sick ever until the last day of his life he's 30 years old he's got one day but in under his belt of pain and suffering you know to me that's not you're not even in the conversation i mean that's nothing that's that's, that's not even suffering that's just you had a bad death sorry you know you got you got whipped first you got, you got with, one, one gospel says the scourging was an open-handed slap to the face. Now the other three do say scourge. But then it's, and then every movie you see, he's carrying that cross. He's all whooped up and bleeding, this and that. He carries the cross in one gospel only. In the other three, it's carried for him. And then he's on the cross and what does he do? Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? And then the gospel says, one of them, and then he gave up the ghost. He gave up and died. I laid in the back of the ambulance for eight hours, doing everything I could in my power to stay alive. Just gave up the ghost. <laughs> There's another video where we make that a little bit more humorous. Anyway, thank you for listening, and um, I guess that's it. Thank you.